is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here as always by Dr. Ed Fang of ThePowerRank.com. You can find him on Twitter, at ThePowerRankEd. Uh, Glad to have you in here. NFL training camps are opening right now. Do you have a favorite NFL team that I should know of? Uh, I feel like if we're on a podcast co-host, it's something I should probably know here. Kind of not really. I grew up in Philly, was an Eagles fan for a long time, disowned them when they got rid of Andy Reid. I understand why it happened. You know, both <laughs> both sides needed a new start. It's not like, you know, I'm not mad at it, but I was just like, you know, I'm kind of done with this team. I live in near Detroit now. Yeah. Um, but of course, you know, Eagles go win the Super Bowl. And now, I mean, if you if you ask me, I guess I would say I'm a Lions fan, which is, Oof. you know, there's no there's no pressure in being a Lions fan. Yeah, that's true. Kind of uh, cathartic. Although, honestly, Ed, like as an NFL analytics guy, you disowning the Eagles for firing Andy Reid is like poetic. Like, is that is that that's the word that, <laughs> no. I, that would come to my mind here for, for hearing that reasoning? Well, yeah. And, and you could definitely say, you know, Ed, you're an analytics guy. They're you know, outwardly the most forward in terms of their analytics now. And I definitely appreciate that. I, I just feel always. like, you know, like, I mean, especially NFL is such a part of the business that like, it's almost good to kind of be agnostic and not yeah. have like rooting interest in some ways. Yeah. Um, same with college football, although obviously with like Stanford educational background and being here in Ann Arbor, there's, right. there's clear rooting interest there. So, you know, the NFL, I can kind of take a step back, yeah. joke around about how I'm a Lions fan and yeah. it's all good. See, it's easier for me, too, because, like, I grew up a Jets fan for some reason, and it's very easy to disconnect yourself being a Jets fan. So, like, I've had no issues with that, and I can just appreciate the NFL as well. Uh, college football, same thing. Uh, I'm not – I'm always going to be uh, inclined towards Northwestern, and I can never bet on them as a result because I know okay. that it would be very stupid uh, for me to do so. I can never I can never remove my, my, my heart out of that. So uh, NFL training camp's opening. We'll be talking NFL later this week with Evan Silva of EstablishTheRun.com, breaking down his process for NFL win totals and all that. Today we're talking with Whale Capper. You can find him on Twitter, at Whale underscore Capper, talking, talking NBA future. NBA championship futures based on free agency and all the trades that have gone down. And it should be a great show. So looking forward to uh, talking with Whale for sure. That will be coming up in just one second. Quick reminder that if you were not with us last week, we had J.J. Zacharyson on. To talk about uh, projections, how he builds those for the NFL, which player props he likes for 2019, and also just generically how he goes about betting player props based on his process and how his process of building projections informs that. We also, in covering the future, Ed talked about uh, the Minnesota Vikings, their Super Bowl futures. I went through Alex Bregman's MVP odds, then bet uh, Alex Bre- or Alex Bowman to win the Cup Series championship, and he proceeded to wreck two different cars in two days in New Hampshire this past weekend, had to drive his teammates' backup car. So we're off to a blazing start here with Alex Bowman <laughs> to win the Cup Series. Uh, you can find that podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Stitcher as well, just by searching for cover- Covering the Spread. And as a new podcast, any ratings and reviews you leave are so deeply appreciated, and also they help us out a ton. So if you like what you heard from JJ or you like what you hear later today uh, from Whale Capper, let us know on Apple Podcasts by leaving a review, and uh, we'll get into Whale Capper in just one second. Uh, but Ed, uh, NBA Futures, the topic for today. Any dabbling for you yet in that market for 2019-2020? Well, when I woke up this morning, I mean, I was just so excited to talk about the futures odds for Oklahoma City that I just couldn't contain myself. So, <laughs> But we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, yeah, definitely some stuff I like. Uh, and yeah, probably going to dabble in it pretty soon Yeah, because I think we're going to get some good numbers. All right, well, well, let's pause here for just one second. We'll bring in Whale Capper to talk about that. Again, follow him on Twitter, at Whale underscore Capper. He is a, an, a handicapper for the NFL, NBA, and tennis as well. So let's bring him in. Here are his thoughts on the NBA. Covering the present. Let's welcome Whale Capper here to the show for covering the presence. And, and Whale, it's been just this crazy NBA offseason. Summer's, you know, in full swing, but I'm sure it's been a busy one for you. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm fantastic, man. And you, you nailed it. This has been the most interesting, exciting, enthralling 
uh, NBA offseason that we've had in the years I've been covering the league from a betting perspective. And uh, as we look across the landscape, you're entering kind of a complete new realm this season where a lot more teams have a chance than the last handful of years. So it's going to be a super fun year to bet the NBA. And how hard is that for you as a better having all this ambiguity? Because there's some level of certainty when, you know, we've seen if we've seen the Warriors play together it, with the same cast for several years, you kind of know what to expect. But this year, I feel like there's been so much change. How hard is that for you when you're building out your algorithms to kind of know what to expect for each individual team? Well, for, for certain, I think uh, you have to kind of be it, be oh, be prepared to scrap your priors earlier than you would otherwise, right? Like, I mean, I'm right. I'm, I'm going right. in with this with a perspective that's informed based on player strengths and you know and movement and and how you know how the landscape is changing and and it's my best guess, but uh, I certainly this year I'm not going to be uh, you know dying on any given hill. Uh, I'm going to be prepared to to pivot pretty quickly once we start to see how these uh, you know how these teams play together. So, Will, uh, how do you come up with the priors? Is this a computational method or is it more subjective in nature? Yeah, so I, lately, I, you know, f- f- throughout my career, I, I mostly look at team level stuff as my starting point because I like to kind of have um, something that's, m- you know, more uh, stable year over year. The, you can incorporate player level kind of predictions and, and combine those into a team level expectation. But you know, you're going to get pretty close to back to the same place that way, in my experience. And so I think uh, going for uh, going for player level stuff is, is good and helpful. And, it, you know, f- for establishing priors, it's kind of the, the key because, you know, we, we have a, you know, a player like, uh, you know, I guess best best example would be the Nets. What do you do with the Nets? They're losing, uh, you know, a player like, um, yeah, you know, D'Lo and they're getting uh, Kyrie Irving. Uh, and, you know, you want some sort of quantification on, you know, what that change is going to do in terms of their offensive and defensive efficiency. And the best way to do that is a player level approach. So let's go here broadly from a process perspective for you, uh, from an NBA futures perspective. It's still July of 2019. And if you're betting the NBA title right now, that's going to tie up some of your bankroll for almost an entire year. So how good of a value does it have to be? for you to actually bet an NBA future at this point in the year? You know, this is a really good jumping off point for all kind of um, preseason action in all sports Um, (laughs) because you have to be, you know, you you can have an absolute guaranteed ROI on, you know, on some sort of position, be it, you know, NBA, college football, NFL, it doesn't matter. But, you know, you, you can corner the market by, you know, by getting ahead of a, a number that's going to move, for instance, and then watch it move, you know, four or five wins and then come back on the other side, uh, you know, so that you have this nice little five win win, you know, middle. Uh, the problem is, you know, that tying up that bankroll over the course of, you know, the regular season impacts, you know, how much you're going to be able to get down on game by game. And so you need to have probably in the ballpark of 15 to 20 percent ROI type of target on those kind of plays um, to make it worthwhile locking up that bankroll. Because if you consider like, okay, over a four month sample size or a six month sample size, however long, you know, however long you intend to bet the NBA day by day, uh, it's pretty easy to turn over enough plays that you only need, you know, like about a half a percent or so ROI on any given play on average uh, in order to make up the difference of what it would mean to lock up that bankroll for the course of, you know, four or six months. So it's, it's a, it's a pretty straightforward math problem. And, um, you know, you can kind of, you know, figure out for yourself, like, okay, this has to have an expected value target of blank in order for it to make sense to lock up this bankroll for that many, that many uh, months. And, and in general, the answer is it's not worth it, but, uh, for, <laughs> but, but for sure, um, you know, for sure, I still get involved in the futures market for sure. There are opportunities where you say, OK, like, you know, this number is going to get a substantially shorter throughout the season. So it's important to have this ticket now in order to give me flexibility, because I know I'm going to be entering entering the futures market, taking other positions on other teams over the course of the season as we learn and understand more. And, you know, you know, there may be some team that you see a number out there now and you're like, man, when people see this team, you know, go out on, you know, start out the season, uh, you know, with the, you know, 
15 to five, 15 and five record or something like after the first month, you know, they're all that, 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 uh, price is going to be substantially shorter and I'll have that ticket in my pocket. So, you know, there, there are pluses and minuses to doing it, but, but in general, uh, you need to have a pretty high expectation of, of how valuable the ticket is before you lock up that bankroll. Excellent. So, well, like, especially this year, I want to ask you more about your process. Are you looking for teams? Like, do you think there's going to be more value in teams that have made a lot of changes? Obviously, with like the Lakers and the Clippers being those teams, or are you looking for teams that have been more static in the off season or and are kind of flying under the radar? Ooh, the way that the market has kind of priced in the expectation that the likes of the Clippers and the Lakers are going to be these all world all world teams. Uh, without having them see seeing them play a minute of basketball together, I think presents value on some of the more established teams that have, you know, that have deep rosters that have known advantages like teams like your your nuggets and your jazz this year are probably good examples. They didn't get a lot of buzz during free agency. They didn't get a lot of, you know, people talking about their, you know, their their chances. But guess what? We know those teams have a built in outstanding home court advantage because they play at altitude we know those teams have you know solid cores that have been playing together year over year everyone knows their roles they've tweaked some pieces on both squads so they should be more competitive or they're getting you know in the case of the nuggets they're getting some some youth uh to inject into their lineup so they should improve um and you know in general they're they're young teams that are on kind of an arc of improvement anyway so you know i do think that uh you know, of teams that as we enter the season, um, you know, the likes of the Jazz and the Nuggets probably hold more value, especially in kind of game by game betting once we get into mm-hmm. October and November uh, than the teams that are expected to be these super teams. Let's talk about those super teams right now and talk about both the L.A. teams, starting off with the Clippers. Paul George and Kawhi Leonard are in town, and they're now the favorites to win at FanDuel Sportsbook, win the NBA championship next year. They're plus 320 right now. And I think based on your previous answer, we kind of know your thoughts on them at that number. Are they the favorites for you personally entering the year, or are you shying away from them given the height that's starting that team right now? Man, that is an awfully short number for a team that has a lot of questions. Uh, Mm -hmm. I I guess – I, you know, I'm a long-term buyer in what they're doing with the Clippers. The fact that the fact that that uh, Jerry West pulled off this deal in the first place is kind of all you need to know about, you know, what tra- trajectory this team is on in general. Um, I have a ton of respect for their coach, Doc Rivers, uh, and uh, Kawhi Leonard, bona fide superstar, bona fide super duper duper star. He <laughs> will 100% win you a series. Uh, you know, when when the going gets tough, we saw it against Philly. We saw it against the Warriors. So it's it's not. Uh, it's not against the Bucks too. I mean, he was the defining you know defining player and kind of um, you know closing the gap and in, in late in games five and six for them. So you know, it's 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 pretty obvious that uh, you know he is on the tier of of players that can win you a title. Uh, you know, and you if I'm back if I'm backing anyone in the futures market to win the NBA championship, they better have a player like that, a player like LeBron, a player like Kevin Durant. You know, you can pretty much count on one hand the players who are capable of single-handedly winning you a playoff series in the NBA. Uh, And uh, Kawhi is one of those guys. So, yes, clearly they should be kind of in the conversation for favorites. Um, But Paul George coming off two shoulder surgeries, you're telling me he's going to be able to carry any kind of offensive load over the first half of the season? I am very skeptical of that. We know that uh, Kawhi Leonard is going to enforce kind of a load management uh, scheme on this Clippers team. Uh, And, you know, they they have depth. They have some nice pieces. They have defense. All of that portends well to being competitive once comes playoff time. But uh, guess what? If you like the Clippers, if you like Kawhi, wait until like December, January. You're going to see a much better number when they're sick because they could very reasonably be in like sixth, seventh standing in the Western Conference, you know, come around, you know, Christmas and New Year's. And at that time, maybe they start to put together a little chemistry, a little bit of a run. But I, this the idea that this team is going to be the favorite to win the NBA title from wire to wire is lunacy. So buying in now at the bottom of the market, is, I mean, at the top of the market is, is not, uh, you know, not a worthy play in my book. Yeah, I mean, I think we, you're absolutely right. What, what we saw with Kawhi in this playoffs that he can put a team on his shoulders. But I think what also we saw in this playoffs was that he felt kind of alone out there at Toronto. <laughs> and, I, and you know, he made the decision to go to L.A., bring Paul George with him, which I think for him is is definitely the long-term play. And, um, yeah, I think their, their future is looking bright. 
Well, I want to ask you about the other L.A. team, the Lakers. They got Anthony Davis. Uh, did you think they gave up too much for him? What do you think their prospects are? There's obviously a guy named LeBron also on that team. Break, break them down for us. Yeah, so in the moment of, you know, after that trade was announced, I felt like it was a lose-lose deal for both teams. Uh, and part of the reason is I feel like they, they – the Pelicans, I didn't think, got more than they could have gotten if they made this deal last year after the All-Star break. I feel like they got a little less. Uh, and, you know, they granted they knew that they were getting the fourth overall pick in this draft. And granted, they did some very clever things in terms of how they put together their, you know, their approach to the draft this year. And they got a player in Hayes who looks unbelievably good. So, you know, it's it's a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit hindsight bias to, to kind of pat the Pelicans on the back so much for kind of what they got for Anthony Davis. They did, they, but they did get a lot. They got a haul. Um, the problem is I think the Lakers, it, they would have been better off as a team and as a franchise if they had had Davis for last year's stretch run. If they could have gotten some playoff minutes with Davis and, and LeBron on the floor together so they can start figuring out each other's roles, how they work best, you know, t- well with each other in the, over the course of a playoff series. Cause playoff series basketball is so different than the regular season. And the idea that in year one, these two guys are going to be able to figure it out on the fly in a very competitive Western conference is a tough, tough pill to swallow. You know, it's, and you know, they, the LeBron kind of arc, uh, is clearly his offensive contributions are coming down, uh, year over year here, which is concerning because we already know he's more or less taking defense off in the regular season. Um, and if his offensive trajectory continues to tail off, then I'm not sure how this team realistically competes for a title over the next couple of years. But it's it. I think they dodged a bullet probably in not picking up a third superstar. I know that was kind of the entire um, you know plan here. We're going to get Davis. We're going to bring in another max guy. Um, but I think the way it worked out where they ended up with a deeper roster overall gives them a heck of a lot more flexibility going into this season than they would have if they had picked up the third superstar that they were going after. Um, so I think, you know, I, I'm a little bit more bullish on the Lakers chances of being competitive in the West than I was a couple of months ago when, you know, when it was looking like they were going to be a complete barbell sort of team top heavy in the most extreme way you could imagine. <laughs> Um, especially with a couple fragile players who are, you know, known to go out with injury, at least in the, especially in the case of Davis, but more recently in the case of LeBron. So it's a, uh, it's going to be um, a fascinating season to see how it plays out. Uh, Lakers coach is an enormous question mark. It seems like mm-hmm. LeBron clearly wanted Jason Kidd, and somehow he's the assistant coach. That has trouble written all over it. Yeah. So, you know, again, the Lakers kind of fall in the same category as the Clippers where they've been overbet substantially in the market. And, you know, yes, they can contend for a title, but you're going to get a much better crack at them at some point in season than you will at this time. So the Clippers and Lakers are two favorites right now, but now maybe not the time to bet them. We're talking here once again with Whale Capper, host of the Deep Dive podcast. And Whale, let's move to the other team here, making big moves during the offseason, the Houston Rockets, because... They've got Russell Westbrook in town, reuniting him with James Harden. They are third in futures, actually fourth in futures odds behind the Clippers, Lakers, and Bucks. One of the more static teams during this offseason in a positive sense. The Rockets at eight to one. What's your view on them right now with Westbrook in town and joining up with James Harden? I'm going to be cautiously optimistic that this okay. is a partnership that can work in the 2019-2020 season. Uh, it's, you know, James Harden clearly, uh, needed some help over the last two seasons, carrying the offensive load in the regular season. I feel like his underperformance year over year in the playoffs is in large part due to how much of the load he carries during the regular season. The, the Rockets at one point last season were legitimately a bubble team to make the playoffs. They were playing so poorly. They were dealing with so many injuries and James Harden single-handedly carried that team into uh, a position where they could even compete for a title last year. Uh, in- injecting a guy like Westbrook who plays a little bit differently. He's not going to shoot the ball necessarily well. So on, at face value, it doesn't necessarily make sense as a fit, but he does things a little differently. He attacks the basket in, you know, in one of the more effective ways across the league. Um, the idea that they're going to be able to create space with a bunch of shooters on the floor and give Westbrook an opportunity to really get after it near the hoops is appealing to me. Um, I like that they were able to hold on to Clint Capella, although he's not shown himself to be effective necessarily in the playoffs. But I like him especially as a regular season player. So you know, I think overall 
uh, there's a lot to look forward to here with the Rockets. And, and if, if Harden can concede some of the um, responsibilities of carrying the offensive load here to Westbrook, I think that sets them up to be more dangerous in the playoffs than we've seen from them the last couple of years. Excellent. So, well, Caber, I can't look at a futures chart without Golden State at 15-1 <laughs> jumping out and just taking up my entire screen. Uh, obviously, Clay Thompson's going to be hurt for a while, but they still have this core that won 73 games a couple years ago. Don't have Kevin Durant anymore. What's your take on the Golden State Warriors? Yeah, I'm with you on this. This is one of the more head-scratching numbers out there because not long after... We kind of, I mean, you know, all, all throughout the off season, it was pretty obvious. I mean, all throughout the, the kind of the late part of the regular season in the playoffs, it was pretty obvious Kevin Durant was headed to New York. We didn't know if he was going Knicks or Nets, but he made it pretty clear at the All-Star break piece he did with Ramona Shelburne. Hey, I'm moving my entire team to New York. We are going to the Big Apple. And so you would have thought at that time that some of the early odds we saw pop would have reflected no Durant on the Warriors, yet they were still kind of in the conversation at the top of the West you know, as you know, more or less the favorites to win the West uh, before we knew Anthony Davis was going to go to the Lakers, before we knew Kawhi was going to go to the Clippers. So the fact that it swung so violently simply on news that we were expecting anyway is surprising. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, the, you know, Clay Thompson being out with an ACL is obviously somewhat concerning, but he, you know, there's plenty of time for him. Uh, to get back into the mix and, and be a contributor once they get to the playoffs. So I mean, when you're evaluating the Warriors, it's they are they are for the first time in many, many years, they are a value bet, which is crazy yeah. to say. But here we are. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I think you have to talk yourself into, OK, well, is Steph Curry capable of carrying the offensive load effectively on his own without Clay Thompson over the course of the regular season this year? And, you know, if he's if if uh, if you know, it's the, the, the X factor in all this really is, um, you know, is D'Angelo Russell. D'Lo yeah. is capable of doing a lot of interesting things on offense, not necessarily a great fit with Steph Curry, but pretty obviously and clearly like a trade piece come, you know, come December, January. Um, I got a funny feeling that we'll see a, you know, a D'Lo for kind of a guy in the, you know, in the sort of swingman type of role uh you know good 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 uh good swap would be uh send D'Lo to the minnesota timberwolves and try to get back uh robert covington and another offensive piece um you know that 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 would immediately i think uh improve my my um expected wins and expected performance for the for the warriors over the season and i feel like a deal like that is imminent um and at that point you're just hoping that the warriors medical staff pulls themselves together and gets Clay Thompson healthy and back on the court. Uh, and then uh, you probably have a pretty nice ticket come uh, come April that you'll be sitting on with a number that no one would believe you actually got if you have 15 to 1. So that, 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 that does make sense to me as a bet right now. And the Wolves, obviously very interested in D'Angelo Russell, so that's not a shock. Seeing Big Shot Bob out west would be a lot of fun, so I'm, I'm on board with this. I like this <laughs> idea. Could be a lot of fun. I don't know if Big Shot Bob still applies, but we'll go with it anyway. Uh, you touched on the Jim, Warriors. Jim, can I, yeah, can I just jump in real quick? Yeah. I just wanted to jump in because Webb was talking so much about how those odds have moved. I feel like the first time I saw Golden State, I saw them somewhere at 10 to 1 Yeah. Um, after we had all the news. So, like, this number is getting longer. Yeah, uh, right. Which I feel like is going the wrong way. Um, but, yeah, just a little bit more history on, on where it is. Also, I like Kevin Looney as well. Uh, I think he's going to be a good piece next year. They're obviously going to miss a good dollar. But, but, yeah, I think we're in agreement on that. Yep, strong agree. Kevin Looney, nice player. So you mentioned the Warriors at 15 to 1. You touched briefly on the Jazz and the Nuggets. The Jazz are uh, 12 to 1. The Nuggets 23 to 1 at FanDuel Sportsbook. If you had to settle on one team that you view as being, like, a value you're willing to bet right now and lock up that bankroll for such a long time as we had discussed, which team stands out most to you based on the ads at FanDuel Sportsbook? Yeah, I, it's the Nuggets for me. I, and it, I went back and forth between the Jazz and the Nuggets because the Jazz, the Jazz, from a metric standpoint, just scream at you a team that is better than the market thinks, right? Like you look at their numbers and they were like clearly a top four or five team for most of the season last year. And they've done nothing but address some of their key weaknesses. So there is there is value on the Jazz, I think. Um, but but what we saw in the playoffs out of, out of, uh, out of Jokic was 
incredible. He is the real deal. He has the tools to make an absolute difference in any playoff series that he's in. Uh, I was shocked that they lost that game seven uh, to the Timberwolves. That was wild. But that sp- spoke to their inexperience. You know, it was a team that was almost all of those players' first ever playoff run, yet they beat Popovich in a series, which was pretty damn impressive. Uh, and now they head into, uh, uh, you know, take presumably take another step forward uh, and I think are going to be a very, very tough out in the playoffs on top of a team that you could conce- conceivably see pile up a lot of regular season wins again. I mean, this is uh, the Nuggets, I think, are, are kind of because of the potential star, super duper star power of a player like Jokic and what he can do from, you know, both the shooting outside and, and getting to the rim, uh, you know, with his size is is potentially the a deciding factor in a playoff series against, you know, equal opponents. So so I'm. I'm I'm a bigger buyer in the Nuggets probably than uh, uh, than any other team in the West right now. Yeah, twenty three to one for a team that does have one of those Kawhi guys you mentioned who can make a difference in a series. I think is certainly very tempting. Uh, that's all we got. Well, I want to thank you for hopping on here. I think it was a fun discussion about kind of how you do your NBA futures bets because for a lot of people they may not know you know the the opportunity cost with betting a future at this time but sounds like the Nuggets worthy of that bankroll burn for a little bit of time so I want to thank you for coming on again enjoy the weather in SoCal uh, hopefully you have a good couple of weeks and hopefully you're getting set for NBA and NFL season thank you again for coming on we'll talk to you again soon for some tennis talk in August oh uh, can't wait guys bucks to win the east awesome <laughs> Covering the future. One final big thank you to Whale Capper for hopping on and talking about NBA futures. Again, follow him on Twitter at Whale underscore Capper to get his thoughts on the NBA, NFL, and tennis. We'll have uh, Whale back on pretty soon here to talk some NFL and, of course, tennis prior to the U.S. Open as well. Once you get in on the action, check out the FanDuel Sportsbook and place your first bet today. If you lose, FanDuel will give you a refund of up to $500 in site credit. Visit sportsbook.fanduel.com for more details. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21 plus and physically present in New Jersey. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Let's move now into covering the future. And Ed, as we look forward to this week, uh, I know you mentioned you were doing your college football numbers up on the PowerRank.com for this week. Any big takeaways for you based on going through that process and looking at what they say for 2019? Yeah, you know, I kind of mentioned Texas Longhorns last week. Coming into the season, there's a ton of hype. They went 10-4 and four last year. Huge wins over Oklahoma and Georgia. But the one thing I want to say about Texas for this year is they're overrated. So I kind of warned Texas fans about, you know, getting my report. Uh, I've offered them a refund on the, the free report that they can get on my site. But, you know, the numbers just don't like Texas this year. Uh, they're ranked 42nd uh, by my numbers. That's going to be way lower than they end up in, in the polls that are going to come out later in August. And you can really argue that 42nd is, you know, the numbers have them a little bit high at 42nd. Uh, and let me get into this. Uh, first, you know, they're obviously propelled by what they did last year, uh, that big win over Georgia. Georgia was missing their two of their best defensive players in that game. Uh, it wasn't something that we knew about beforehand, but when they kicked, they didn't have two of their best players getting ready for the draft. Um, and then the other thing that, you know, when I do my preseason model, like one of the most important factors is how they performed last year. And the, what I do, what I put in is my team rankings. And these are the algorithms I developed based on my research. Uh, it takes margin of victory in, in games and adjusts for strength of schedule. A simple yet still powerful predictor. And Texas was 14th by those numbers. And that's what's, you know, and despite that, they're still 42nd. You could also evaluate this Texas team in a different way from last season. You can take yards per play, offense, defense, adjust for strength to schedule, put them back together, and rank them as a team. They were as low as 30th last year when you look at adjusted yards per play. So so they might not even have been as good last year based on the Georgia game, big Georgia win, um, when you look at some efficiency metrics. They might not have been as good as even we thought them. I, I definitely don't think they were as good as a 10-win season. They might have been even worse. And then the numbers are also seeing a lack of returning stars. This isn't such a big deal on offense. They get quarterback Sam Ellinger back. They got a stud at Colin Johnson at wide receiver. They should be good. I'm not super high on Ellinger as a quarterback. I think he's got limited upside. 
you know, how much better are they going to do than the 59th in adjusted yards per play that I had them ranked last year? We'll see. But where this really comes in is on the defensive side of the ball. They are gutted of their top performers from last year. Uh, they lose defensive end Charles Amenahu, Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year, cornerback Chris Boyd, uh, another key piece that got drafted in the NFL. So this unit was 24th last year, and it's going to require a minor miracle to stay at that level, a top 25 level. So I'm, uh, I think Texas is going to be seriously overrated this year. Nine and a half wins seems a lot of very high at the FanDuel Sportsbook. And, and just let me close with one other thing. You know, you're going to see a lot this year about how Tom Herman um, is great as an underdog and is terrible as a favorite. Uh, I could quote numbers, but this is a kind of trend that just screams small sample size to me. Yeah. Like, please don't make any of your bets based on what Tom Herman has done over four years of coaching. And I know you can, you know, you can kind of make up these stories about why this is true. And, and I'm sure some of those are, are true, but it, I, it's small sample size. It's screaming regression to mean to me. Um, you know, if that's, you know, bet against Texas, if you think they're not a good team and you agree with me, bet for Texas, if you think Ellinger is going to be a first round draft pick next year. Sure. Um, but just don't put too much weight in, in, in these, in these kind of trends of, of what Tom Herman teams have done. It's just a very different context for 2019 than what the context was with where he was previously. And I think that that's right. a key thing that is lost in those numbers. Also, Losing a guy with the name as glorious as little Jordan Humphrey, like <laughs> name value matters a lot in my algorithms, and that's a big that's a big loss for Texas. So uh, I agree. Yeah, that, you know, a it's, uh, it's a too, tough man. loss. Yeah. Uh, my covering the future bet for this week is going to go to the NFL because I haven't gotten to talk NFL yet. And when I look at the MVP odds on FanDuel Sportsbook, there's one name. That stands out to me. I didn't go Marcus Mariota, despite the fact that I always, for some reason, gravitate towards Marcus Mariota. But you look at the odds for MVP, and you see Cam Newton at 50-1. to 1. I think that's much longer than it should be. Those are the same odds as Matthew Stafford, who may throw the ball five times in total in 2019. Dak Prescott's there, and Prescott I can understand more. But Cam's odds are also longer than Jimmy Garoppolo and Mitchell Trubisky. Cam's MVP odds tied for 16th among all quarterbacks, and I think a lot of this is due to the shoulder injury, but let's play the assumption game here. Something we talk a lot about on the DFS podcast, where if you assume Cam Newton is healthy, I don't think he's longer than 25 to 1 or so at most. He's actually not even the shortest guy on his team. Christian McCaffrey is 34 to 1 to win MVP at FanDuel Sportsbook, and given how rarely running backs win, especially in this analytics age, it seems odd that Cam is not at least shorter than Christian McCaffrey. Last year, before that shoulder injury got really bad, I think it was that game against uh, Tampa Bay where it really got pretty bad, he had uh, 7.9 adjusted yards per attempt at that point. That would have been the second best mark of his entire career, trailing only the year that he won MVP. And he also had just four rushing touchdowns last year, which is the fewest that Newton has had his entire career. So if we get some more variance along the goal line where Cam Newton is not deferring to Christian McCaffrey, you know, healthier, taking that rock himself, we could see some pretty gaudy numbers in the rushing category in addition to potentially getting back to where he was last year as a passer. This offensive line is, I believe, 12th in my offensive line rankings, now up on number fire. They've got good playmakers, and DJ Moore and Curtis Samuel. They'll win every track meet every single week, and that has a lot of value. So I think that there's definitely some risk here with Cam Newton and that shoulder injury, but I like to play the assumption game. And if Cam Newton comes out during training camp, as it starts now, and looks healthy, he's not going to be 50-1 to 1 for very long. So I think that it makes a lot of sense to get in on Cam now before we get those reports about his health. If he's not healthy, you know, then that's going to be a loss. And you're going to you know, take that L for sure. But 50 to 1, given the odds that thing moves pretty soon, I'm going to take that for sure. Ed, any thoughts for you on the Panthers as we get set for 2019? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as, as far as Cam goes, to me, like... What I don't like about Cam is his accuracy. He's yeah. not one of the most accurate quarterbacks, and and you want to kind of you know tend towards those guys for success, both team and and MVP level. But you're absolutely right that I think there's a ton of value in his MVP odds for all the reasons that you mentioned. Um, and you know you actually shouldn't take my opinion on it. You should take Evan Silva's opinion on it because this was the future bet that he talked about on my show oh, on my okay. podcast, the Football Analytics Show. Uh, and that was, I mean, he was gushing about this for all the same reasons that you mentioned. Um, 
Evan's going to also be our guest uh, later this yeah. week as well. But yeah, I think there's a lot of reasons to think that 50 to one is 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 a pretty good one to is a pretty good futures bet to tuck away in your account. And that one is queued up for me. That podcast is I had to listen before Thursday. Clearly, I hadn't listened yet. So I'm excited to uh, to dive into that. As Ed mentioned, Evan will be on here on uh, for Friday morning talking about uh, his win total bets for 2019. So make sure you subscribe to Covering the Spread on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcasts. And once again, ratings and reviews help us a ton. So uh, we thank you. If you liked what Whale Capper said earlier, uh, leave us a review, leave us a rating, and uh, leave one for Evan Silva later in the week as well. Ed, any big things popping over at the Power Rank for this week prior to Friday? Yeah, I mean, we're still got the college football win totals report. Uh, you can get my win total for Texas. I should give it to you right now. It's significantly lower than nine and a half. So let me just let me just put that out yeah. there. But there's a win total for 130 teams based on my preseason model. Uh, the model has been successful at predicting the game winner straight up in 70 percent of games over the last five years. It's something that I use as an objective baseline to start the season. And I think you should as well. So check it out at thepowerrank.com. All right. Thank you, Ed. I appreciate that. We'll talk to you again on Friday. Awesome. All right. Looking that is Ed, Yeah, absolutely. That is Ed Fang. Follow him on Twitter at the Power Rank. I am at Jim Sonnes, J I M S A N N E S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast on Twitter. We'll talk to you once again on Friday to break down NFL win totals with Evan Silva. Until then, good luck with your bets. And we'll talk to you once again later this week. This has been Covering the Spread here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 